welcome back. His name is Dan Osmond, a Guinness record holder and a legend. Over the past 11 years, Dan thrilled, amazed, and inspired everyone who saw him in action. On November 23, 1998, Dan Osmond died doing what he loved to do. Now a tribute to the man who revolutionized the sport and took us to places no man had ever gone before. Dan Osmond gained fame and recognition for a spectacular sport he created called rope freefalling. Tied to the end of a rope anchored to a structure, Dan hurled himself through space facing death head on. He bathed in the rush. I can do a lot of things for an adrenaline rush, but uh, I choose this because it's the only way to get like pure raw adrenaline, you know, and fear all together in one. Eric Perlman has documented Dan's daring accomplishments for eight years. Dan was a wild man, creative and bold and exuberant, but he was also methodical, patient, and precise in his technical mastery of the equipment involved and his understanding of the dynamics of every challenge that he undertook. He spent endless hours perfecting his world-class skills, and his expertise as a climber and a rigger were in big demand. He trained the elite U.S. Navy SEALs Commando Fighting Unit and taught safety workers how to scale buildings. Despite the demands on his life, he always found time to spend with his eight-year-old daughter, Emma. You know what's your Blair to be spun upside down? It was really fun watching Dan and Emma climb together. It was like the great duet, the great love duet of a father and daughter playing and growing and maturing and enjoying their life together. When his thoughts weren't on Emma, he was focused on setting three new rope free-falling records. He leapt 200 feet suspended across a canyon, 300 feet off a cliff, and an astonishing 650 feet off a bridge. The difference between rope free-flying, which is what I do, and, say, bungee jumping, for instance, is that a bungee is a big rubber band that just kind of boing and stretches out and slows you down very slowly, where I use a climbing rope, which is made of nylon, and what it does is it lets you go all the way to the deck and stops you just before impact. Rope free-falling is where he gained his fame, but it didn't stop there. He became the first person to climb a rushing waterfall. Battling raging currents and near freezing temperatures, he turned the impossible into the probable. I like to invent new sports because I can do things that no one else has ever done. No one believes that I can really do it until I come back alive with a smile on my face. Dan was always looking for new ways to up the thrill and push the envelope. He found it in the perilous sport called free climbing. Free climbers use no ropes or gear. One of the boldest things I ever saw Dan do was free solo rock climbing. He would climb up these roots that were so steep and so hard, he'd be hanging by his fingertips and his toes, and that's it. And these were so steep that once he started, he couldn't turn back. It was summit or plummet. Like everything else he did, Dan mastered the sport. He became one of the top free climbers in the world, but that wasn't enough. Dan had to find a way to take this sport to new extremes, and he did. He added an even more lethal element, speed. He became the first person on Earth to speed free climbing. On Thursday, May 29, 1997, Dan set out to establish a new record for speed free climbing. He would attempt to race up the face of a 400-foot-high sheer granite wall in six minutes. How fast is that? Well, an experienced two-person team using safety gear might climb this wall in two hours if they're good. Dan aimed to do it without safety gear in an astonishing six minutes. 400 feet in six minutes flat. No safety harnesses, no ropes, no excuses. It's really dangerous, there's no doubt about it, because you're moving so fast that you only really have time to, like, check your footholds and stuff. He steadies his nerves. And what you're about to see is amazing. Dan quickly reads the face of the mountains. Jamming his hands into the narrow crevices, he uses them like anchors to pull himself up. All that stands between Dan and the ground is the air that he breathes. And one mistake could be his last. About halfway up the mountain, death grabs at Dan. He misses his mark and slips, but his other hand is anchored, narrowly saving his life. 
In many places, Dan is precariously perched on a razor-thin ledge. Two-thirds of the way up, Dan breezes past a climber who is struggling up the mountain using ropes and gear. At the 300-foot mark, Dan faces his most terrifying challenge. He has to leap from a ledge to grab hold of an overhang. For a moment, he will have to be airborne. This treacherous move is called a double dino. Here it comes. He's done it. Once again, Dan has cheated death. As he scales the final 50 feet of the mountain, Dan pushes through fatigue and fights his way to the top. Dan reaches the summit in an amazing five minutes and 52 yeah. seconds. A new Guinness record for speed-free climbing. What an amazing climb. Let's take another slow motion look at that terrifying moment when Dan went airborne. As you can see, Dan's entire body was suspended in midair. Dan Osmond is one Guinness record holder who is truly king of the hill. When we return, you'll see Dan Osmond's final record attempt. Still to come, you may have heard about him or even seen a glimpse of him. Now, it's the never-before-seen pictures of the man they call Two-Headed Chang. Now, Dan Osmond's final record attempt. An attempt that would ultimately cost Dan his life. This is the ominous Leaning Tower Mountain in Yosemite National Park, the place where rock climbing outlaw Dan Osmond would set his final Guinness record. He is going to rope freefall 1,000 feet down the face of this sheer granite cliff. I've been rope freefalling for nine years, and I'm pushing 2,000 jumps, and the uh, Leaning Tower will be my biggest one ever. Dan not only wants to break his current cliff jump record of 300 feet, but shatter it and put it out of reach. The Leaning Tower, in comparison to other jumps I've done, is huge. It's like three to four times bigger than any other cliff jump that I've done. This jump will challenge Dan in ways he has never been tested. The landing zone is a thick forest of pine trees. He runs the very real risk of impaling himself on one of the trees staring up at him like laser-sharp spikes. Dan has the most narrow of clearings in the trees where he can land, only 50 feet. From the height he's falling, it's like diving through the opening of a drinking cup. My biggest fear in the Leaning Tower jump is hitting trees because I'm pushing this jump so far that um, I'm actually going to be impacting below the actual tops of these 150-foot high pine trees. I'm going to be coming in hot below the tree line. In spite of these dangers, in his last chilling interview, Dan dismisses any possibility that he could lose his life in this record attempt. A lot of people think that I'm going to die doing this. They think it's reckless and crazy. But the thing is, I've done it so much that I know that it's really safe. Dan's experience and knowledge will be tested in ways they never have. He will be plunging down the face of the mountain at speeds of more than 120 miles an hour. And he'll be trusting his life to a half-inch thick rope, which must hold up under the tremendous strain of his speed and weight. A combined force of more than 2,000 pounds. The specially woven rope contains nylon fibers and is designed to stretch. And I want this thing to stretch because at the end of the fall, you want it to give you some cush so it doesn't basically snap your neck. And we don't want the jump line to... Dan must be very careful about the flight path he chooses. If he veers to either side or he doesn't get the thrust he needs, he will slam into one of the many boulders jutting out from the side of the mountain. I'm just going to do a standard base jump, like the track position, about going to kind of a delta and try and scoop some air, get away from the wall if I can. The moment has finally come for Dan to jump. For the first time, he admits that he's scared. This is it. This is the scariest. First time. Cameras have been set up at strategic points on the cliff to capture the world record free fall attempt from various angles. The only thing that I want to think about before I step off is my body. So I do a triple check from top to bottom, up and down one more time to make sure that everything's okay. Other than that, I don't want to be thinking about anything else. Remember, there are no nets, no safety lines, no parachutes to break his fall. 
Will his untested system of ropes, pulleys, and anchors hold up? Jump out, chest out, bust through. Feel the wind coming in, stiffen the legs. Head down, cup the chest, cup the wind with the hands. Okay. He's ready. Five. He counts four, it down. Three, two, one, launch! Dan's fall seems eternal, but now for the moment of truth. The ropes must hold. They have, and Dan is safe. And he has a new Guinness record, a cliff rope free fall of 1,000 feet. Here's how it looked to Dan. Yeah! Woo oh, man. Let's take a look at it in slow motion. Watch how Dan cups his body to catch air and steer himself away from the wall and towards the tiny clearing in the trees. Dan Osmond's 1,000-foot cliff rope freefall earned him a place in the Guinness Record Book, and he couldn't be prouder. The Guinness Book of World Records is the mark of excellence in human achievement, and I'm honored to be a part of it. Having set a record many thought impossible, Dan sensed he couldn't continue to cheat death. I've really been going at a high rate, basically mock speed for the past several years doing this rope flying stuff. And, um a little bit of relaxation time and give my guardian angels some time off because they've been doing a heck of a job. Too exhausted to tear down the hundreds of pounds of ropes, anchors, and pulleys, Dan left them in place. Three weeks later, he returned to retrieve them. One of the last things I said to Dan on that last day I saw him was, that's enough. Park it, put your toys away. Give it a rest, spend some time with your daughter, enjoy your life. Driven to push his own limits and still trusting his guardian angels, Dan decided to jump one last time. Go now. This time, there were no cameras. He was accompanied only by his friend, Miles Dasher. Okay, when uh, Dano went on his uh, last jump, I heard him launch off. You know, it's like an eight, nine second delay. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And the rope usually makes a swishing sound. Daniel likes to call it flossing the sky. It makes this And uh, I started hearing that. And then that swish didn't, it wasn't a full swish. Heard Daniel give a brief yell. I mean, he must have known that something had gone wrong and that he was, this was it. And then it just sounded like a tree crashed in half. And at this point, I was freaking, and I know my good bro's dead. Dan was found dead, lying peacefully on the canyon floor. His rope had mysteriously snapped. Some speculated it had become weathered and worn. People always used to ask him if he didn't have a death wish, and his most common response was, no, he had a life wish. And it was just pushing the edge of life and finding out what happens there at the, at the edge of life and death and the edge of fear and joy. Dan Osmond, age 35, two-time record holder, but his proudest accomplishment, raising his now 12-year-old daughter, Emma. I think Emma, for Dan, was the affirmation of life. She represented everything that, he, that made him laugh and smile. And, and enjoy the day. Dan Osmond, one Guinness record holder whose accomplishments will live forever. Coming up next, from Southwest China, it's one record that's guaranteed to make you do a double take. Get set for never before seen pictures of the man they call Two Headed Chang. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Welcome back. Our next record comes from deep inside the Chinese countryside. It's the story of a young man named Chang who possesses a most unusual 
and shocking physical deformity. I warn you in advance, this segment is extremely graphic. Beijing Medical University Hospital is located in the center of bustling Beijing, China. And it's recognized as one of Asia's most advanced centers for plastic and reconstructive medicine. Recently, resident surgeon Dr. Wang DeMay and her colleagues reviewed the files of one of their most challenging patients ever. The case of Chang Zipang, the man with two faces. Dr. DeMay recalls how she learned about her most unusual patient. In the summer of 1979, a doctor at Quinning Hospital told me about a case he thought I could help with. A relative of Chang had brought him to downtown Quinning to show him around for a charge of five cents. A lot of the people surrounded him until the police took him away to the police station. The police were shocked to see his face, so they called the hospital. The doctor went there and took some photographs. Later, he showed me the photos. It was pitiful. I said we needed to give him some treatment, some kind of operation. Dr. DeMay was convinced she could help Chang and perhaps prevent him from being further exploited. She and her staff made a six-day journey to the remote mountain village where the 35-year-old peasant man worked and lived. Meeting with Chang's parents, they summoned Chang from the fields. It was the first time Dr. DeMay saw the deformity for herself. A second set of severely deformed facial features growing on the right side of Chang's head. It appeared as if a second face was trying to push its way out of Chang's skin. It's known as a parasitic twin a portion of a twin that only partially develops. Clearly visible was a lump of scalp covered in coarse hair, a gnarled, drooling mouth containing 12 teeth, a small tooth-shaped tongue, and partially developed eye sockets with thin eyebrows but no eyelashes. Dr. DeMay had never seen anything like it. In China, usually a child born with a parasitic twin is killed at an early age. So we seldom see any patient who's over 35 years. Chang's parents explained to Dr. DeMay why Chang was still alive. When he was born, his family saw his head coming out. It was coming out twisted. So his father was undecided about whether Chang should be allowed to live. So his parents go to a fortune teller. The fortune teller told them not to kill him because the head will bring good fortune. The soothsayer saved Chang's life. But it was a life filled with heartbreak. A white cloth covered his second face all during his childhood and his teen years. When his parents arranged for a marriage, Chang's new bride fled in tears when she saw the disfigured second face for the first time on their wedding day. Hoping to bring some good fortune into Chang's life, Dr. DeMay transported him to a nearby hospital. Eager doctors greeted their new patient warmly. Upon closer examination, it became clear that both of Chang's faces were interconnected. Watch as he moves his primary mouth, you can see his secondary mouth move as well. An x-ray revealed the existence of an undeveloped egg-sized brain, and further evidence of the twin was discovered on Chang's back, where a vestigial hump is clearly visible. But because Chang was not bothered by the hump, Dr. DeMay focused solely on removing just the second face. Our goal was the complete excisement of the parasitic head. Because it was cosmetic, there was very little risk for Chang. In a radical procedure, Chang's undeveloped twin brother was surgically removed. After the operation, when we uncovered Chang's face, he saw his new face and was very excited. He was holding the mirror for a long time. Then he asked us to show him his small head. We showed him the head, which was in the glass tube. He was very happy. Chang's miraculous transformation has earned a Guinness record as the world's largest surgically removed parasitic head. Four months after he left, Chang returned triumphantly to his small village. Chang's father, who once considered killing his son when he first saw his deformity, was in awe at the transformation. When we arrived, his parents were very excited and repeatedly touched his face. All the people from the village came and surrounded him to take a look, and they were all very happy especially Chang.
to underscore how rare Chang's condition was. At the time of his surgery, there were only three reported cases of successful removals of a parasitic head in medical history. Now, here's a look at the future on Phoenix. It's the record that everyone is still talking about. Don't miss the worm man, Mark Hogg, as he defends his record in the Super Bowl of worm eating. It's three men and one woman in a winner-take-all challenge you won't believe. That's our record-setting show for this evening. On behalf of Mark Thompson and everyone here at Guinness Prime Time, I'm Chris Collinsworth. Good night.